The state of our amazing state is strong. For the first time in years, the state of the state address returned. The three big takeaways and the three things the governor did not address. Plus, those hoping to take Governor Mike DeWine's spot will face off this week. What to watch out for during the Ohio debates. And hear more of our exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Dr. Amy Acton. She'll reflect on her place in history. And thanks for joining us on Face the State. I'm Clay Gordon, in for Tracy Townsend this week. Leaders from across the state came together for the first time in three years. They once again gathered in the State House for the governor's State of the State. Governor Mike DeWine said his goal was to celebrate the wins and shine a light on the work that still needs to be done. Pet TV's Brittany Bailey has his message to Ohioans. Governor DeWine delivered his first State of the State address since before the pandemic. As he faces re-election, his message was this. Ohio is strong and ready to make some noise. The state of our amazing state is strong. With that kickoff, Governor Mike DeWine spent roughly the next hour touting what Ohio has done to get through the pandemic and move the state into the future. And as with any state of the state, the governor painted a rosy picture of his accomplishments, but also took time to honor those on the COVID front lines. We owe such a debt to our health care workers, our nurses, our doctors, our first responders, frontline workers, grocery store clerks, restaurant workers, local health department personnel, our teachers, all educators. The governor touted investments for expectant parents, the intel development, and funding for law enforcement. But he admitted the state still has a long way to go when it comes to mental health resources. Friends, Ohio has just taken off. And all of us in this chamber are building the environment, the climate in this state, where every Ohioan can have a better life, and where Ohio children can dream, and those dreams can really, really come true. But our work is not done. In many ways, our work is just beginning. Some of the things we did not hear from the governor today were any mentions of the House Bill 6 controversy, the recent gun legislation he signed into law, and the current redistricting fiasco. Reporting at the State House, Brittany Bailey, 10 TV News. The Democrats did not shy away from the redistricting issue when responding to the state of the state. Fair districts mean better representation, which means better, more responsive government by and for the people. Republicans continue to blatantly disregard these cries by passing unconstitutional state and congressional maps. Representative Allison Russo also said her party and the American Rescue Plan are the reasons Ohio is turning a corner from the pandemic. And many of the initiatives that were mentioned by the governor today such as efforts to improve education, expand access to child care and support law enforcement were only made possible because of the $10.93 billion that Ohio state and local governments received from ARPA funding from Democrats in Congress and President Biden. To listen to DeWine's full state of the state address, go to 10TV.com or click on the story on the 10TV mobile app. This week, the Democrats hoping to take DeWine's seat will square off in a debate in Wilberforce. There will not be a Republican debate because DeWine turned down the invitation. That caused Jim Renacci to say he didn't want to debate either. We talked with OSU political science professor Herb Asher about what this means for the governor primary. Governor DeWine basically, you know, is ahead and he basically you know, made, I think, or his advisors made the decision that he doesn't need to debate, that he, in fact, uh, in fact, the debate would have too many risks for him. And so therefore he chose not to. And, you know, some people criticized him, the debate commission crit criticized him. But in this case, there's no great penalty in not participating. 
his opponent maybe could have charged him, you know, with running away from the debate. But his opponent then said, I'm not going to, his major opponent, I'm not going to participate. So uh, debates get caught up in not just uh, sort of the good government perspective, let's say that the League of Women Voters would bring to it, but the campaigns, the candidates and the campaign strategists and managers. So uh, uh, I don't think it's going to be a great loss. The Democrat governor candidates Nan Whaley and John Cranley will square off Tuesday. Here's what to look out for with this one. Those candidates have an opportunity to introduce themselves to a larger audience, if you will. And I think the audience, and especially the Democrats and the, uh, who are watching this, will want to ask the question, well, which candidates seem to be more in agreement with my views? Which candidates have answered the questions? You know, a very typical behavior of candidates in debates is not to answer the questions they were asked, but to answer the questions they want to answer. So oftentimes it's left to the viewers uh, to in fact make the judgment, were the candidates responsive to the questions and, were the, and did, was what they said, you know, compelling. There will most likely be more eyes on the Senate debate after this tense exchange last week. You may not understand this because you've I never been in the private. No, you don't. I do. You've never been in the I private sector in your life. All right, I've worked, sir. Josh, squat. Two chores in Iraq. Don't, don't tell me I haven't worked. Don't, don't tell me I haven't worked. You, you don't know squat. Yes, yes. It's okay, right? It's you don't know squat. Two tours in Iraq. Guys, don't tell me I haven't worked. Back off, buddy. You're gonna you back off. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, never. That'll happen. But sit down. Never. Watch. Yeah. Watch. We'll swear it away with the wrong dude. No, no, you're dealing with the wrong guy. You watch what happens. You watch what happens. That was Republican Senate candidates Mike Gibbons and Josh Mandel at a previous debate. They have had two uh, to be pulled apart while the audience booed at them. Since they had that, there's been a couple other debates in between. Tomorrow, they will share their stage with State Senator Matt Dolan, Neil Patel, Mark Fukita, Jane Timken and J.D. Vance. So will that blow up between Gibson and Mandel play a role in this next debate? Both of them were making statements that were quite a bit uh, off uh, message, if you will. Uh, when Gibbons said, well, I don't really know what I've invested in. Uh, I'm too busy working in my business. I don't know that. And I'm thinking that's not exactly a compelling answer. Uh, Mandel kept on saying, uh, don't tell me I didn't work. Uh, and that's not what that's not what Gibbons said. Gibbons said you weren't in the private sector. He was very careful there. If I can give you a historical example here, many, many years ago, Howard Metzenbaum and John Glenn were in a debate. They were running, I think, the nomination for the Senate. And Metzenbaum said to John Glenn, you've never held a job, which was a major gaffe because John Glenn said, I serve my country. I've been in the military for decades. I served in two wars. I'm in the space. Don't tell me I've never served. Don't you respect service? And uh, that's, not what, that's not what Gibbons said. He said uh, uh, basically that you've never been in the private sector. So that, you know, the two of them uh, did not do, you know, great service to, to their reputations. And as you watch the video, you know, there's Jane Tipkin and J.D. Vance and, and Dolan just sitting there. Uh, uh, and I'm thinking one of them should have had the good sense. Like you couldn't quite hear the backgrounds. Should have just said, knock it off, guys. This is about the voters learning something about us. Overall, Asher says there are three topics you should listen for in the debates this upcoming week, starting with the war in Ukraine. What's your view about how do you confront the Russians? What makes you think the Russians might stop at Ukraine? You know, I think, you know, uh, what, what trust do you have in Putin? And this gets complicated for Republicans because one of Putin's best friends in the United States was Donald Trump. And a number of these candidates are saying they're, they're, they're joined with Donald Trump at the hip. You know, they, Donald Trump, you know, I'm more pro-Trump than anybody else. And, the, 
And so I think, I think Ukraine becomes something. Then I think we have to get into a serious discussion about uh, the economy, but not let people get away with saying, oh, this is the worst economy. The economy actually in many ways, in terms of jobs and people working is very good, but inflation is very worrisome. So what thoughts do you have about inflation other than saying it's all Joe Biden's fault, it's Joe Biden who did this, who did that or whatever? The third topic to watch out for is COVID-19 and the candidate's stance on vaccination requirements and pandemic restrictions. 10 TV will be at the debates tomorrow and Tuesday. Look for team coverage starting tomorrow on Wake of CBUS. One local lawmaker is trying to make it easier for parents to run for office. State Representative Latina Humphrey introduced a bill to allow candidates to use campaign funds to pay for child care. Her own experience inspired this idea. It's personal to me, right? You know, I am a single mom to a nine year old little boy. Um, and I got involved in, in what you would call, you know, the land of politics or whatever it is um, about six 2016 is what I'll say. Um, and, you know, all I had was the support of my son's father's mother. Um, and that was really hard, you know, having to come out of pocket and things like that. And just thinking how much more I really could have supported her as she supported me in my journey. If I had, you know, been running for office even now in this position, you know, to be able to pay you know, pay her with campaign funds. And this is going to allow more women uh, to be able to run for office, more people just in general, working class people, to be able to run for office. Now, Pass Ohio would join 26 other states that have approved the use of campaign funds for child care. This week, the bill was referred to the Government Oversight Committee. And still to come, another investment into the Buckeye State, how Honda plans to use a massive wind tunnel. Plus, shining a spotlight on veterans in need. The push a local widow is making in hopes of sparking a national change. A moment of history on the high court. Hearings took place this past week for Katanji Brown Jackson. She was nominated as the first black woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. And Ohio Congresswoman Joyce Beatty spoke in support of her nomination. If confirmed, she would shatter a glass ceiling that many Americans, including those who fought and died for voting rights, a more perfect union and a just America, believe that they would never live to see it broken. As a black woman myself, I urge this body to remember that Judge Jackson's confirmation vote must not be isolated to her gender or to her race. Instead, I urge you to closely examine her credentials and her sterling judicial record. She is grounded in family values, love of God and country and academic excellence. In my recent conversation with her, it became immediately clear why President Biden chose her. Her life experience, education, and reverence for the rule of law clearly demonstrate that she has been preparing for this moment her entire life. Congresswoman, appreciate you being here. Congresswoman Beatty is chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. This week, Honda unveiled a new $124 million state-of-the-art facility. The Halo facilities in East Liberty will improve testing capabilities for Honda and Acura vehicles with a wind tunnel. It generates speed of more than 190 miles per hour. Lieutenant Governor John Houston says this investment will increase STEM talent and innovation. I mentioned the fact that our educational institutions and our business community uh, are aligned in generating more and more STEM talent so that we can have the scientists, the engineers, the computer technicians, in this case the aerospace engineers, working on cutting-edge innovation. This facility is Honda's latest investment in Ohio, now totaling $14 billion. There's a push to expand the entertainment business in Ohio. State Representative Laura Lanise of Grove City introduced a bill to create new incentives for gaming, animation, and motion picture production companies to relocate here to the Buckeye State. She says too many college graduates are leaving Ohio because this opportunity they need are not here. 
my goal is to try to both build the industry, but also to attract, to keep those students who are getting the degrees that we are funding here and to try to keep them in Ohio so that they can um, raise their families here and pretty much um, have the Ohio dream. Under the bill, these companies would get a 35% tax credit, which would be capped at $2 million in the first year. There's a push to expand health care eligibility for veterans exposed to burn pits. Veterans across the country say more and more soldiers are suffering from cancer and other respiratory illnesses. They say it comes from waste and trash burned at the camps in Iraq. Senator Sherrod Brown is behind a bill to make it easier for veterans to get treatment. We need to move forward on all of this quickly because these veterans need they, they need to be able to go to the VA, diagnose these at an early stage. It will say it will save the lives of many of them. A local woman is fighting for that bill in honor of her late husband. 10 TV's Kiana Deitches spoke with families dealing with the aftermath of burn pits. This is a war that followed him home. After a one year deployment in Iraq, Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson was diagnosed with lung cancer. He eventually lost his voice and ended up with a paralyzed vocal cord. He died at 39, leaving behind his wife and daughter who watched him fight the battle head on. She's gone into the bathroom and found her daddy on the bathroom floor, barely able to breathe, um, gushing nosebleeds that honestly would make our bathroom look like a crime scene. Robinson says her husband's illness came from his exposure to chemicals from trash burned at his camp in Iraq. We don't burn trash in the United States for a reason. We know why we don't burn trash. But why did they do this and poison a ton of our soldiers and put their lives on the line over in Iraq? He died as they fought to get benefits to treat his conditions. He's just one of thousands of servicemen and women who are suffering. With five different lung conditions, Andrew Nightsling is one of them. The constrictive bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a life-shortening, irreversible, incurable lung disease. A new bill heads to the Senate to make sure veterans with conditions like cancer and emphysema won't have to prove their illnesses were the result of their service. Nightsling fears it may be too late. I fear that I won't be alive when they finally start owning up to all these toxic exposures. Gannon Deitches with that story. If the bill gets through the Senate, it would amount to more than $300 billion over the next decade. March is Women's History Month, and we are highlighting two Central Ohio women who are making a difference. First, hear from Dr. Amy Acton in our exclusive 10 TV interview. The former Ohio Department of Health Director talks about what's next. And hear from a woman who plays a key role in making sure other women's business dreams come true. She played a big role in Ohio's early response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She gained national attention and even an online fan club. Now, former director of the Ohio Department of Health is opening up about her part in it all. 10 TV's Tracy Townsend recently sat down for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Dr. Amy Acton. What do you see as your place in history? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. It was the honor of a lifetime to hold that space for Ohioans. It was certainly unintended. Um, I'm a very ordinary person who found themselves in an extraordinary moment in time. There is a Kenyan professor that said that he studied about seven weeks of pandemic press conferences and said that we created a ritualized holding space all by accident. You know, we came out one day and said, we're gonna tell you what we know as we know it. And then we said 2 p.m., who's watching the Ohio News Network, right? And, you know, we're just gonna come so that the media could know all at one time, it just seemed more expedient. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden we were sitting with the media and they had parents and they had kids at home and we were all going through the same thing. And we started talking to Ohioans and I think the space we created I was not scripted. That really speaks to the leadership that they did that. We talked straight to Ohioans. It wasn't through the lens of politics. Um, we, we had something that became something we all had. Mm -hmm. And to be a part of that and to see that feeling of Ohioans 
all ships rising and lifting together was the honor of a lifetime. And I, I was, I said I was the tip of the iceberg. There were 1,100 people behind me, a bunch of cabinet directors, eventually every school superintendent and board member and parent and nurse and everyone. It was all of us. Um, and to be with, uh, to be in that moment with everyone was just a privilege. Any ideas <laughs> what's next for you? <laughs> oh, I always thought when I went into this job that I would just, I'm going, I'm really scared. I didn't know a governor. I'm going to go serve. And I hope to just go back to my life and be, you know, get back to my normal life. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've reflected a lot. And, you know, I have had opportunities to do a lot of different things, but I realized like I really do just want my life back. <laughs> and I, I want to be in Ohio. I'm, once you feel the weight of the responsibility of Ohioans, you fall in love mm -hmm. and you don't want to stop. And, and you don't let that go lightly, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to figure out the ways that I, uniquely who I am, can give back. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think you'll see soon, you'll see me doing things mm -hmm. <laughs> that I hope feel like me. Um, I let my heart kind of move me. I've never been a very smart career person. <laughs> and, um, but you know, I'm very moved by some things I'm seeing and I wanna be part of healing and hope. So I wanna be part of helping us emerge and pull together. And you could listen to all of Tracy's interview. Just look for it on the 10 TV mobile app. March is Women's History Month, and at least one Central Ohio business leader is proof women's history happens every single day. Ina Kinney is the CEO of Economic and Community Development Institute, ECDI, which is a micro lender to minority-owned businesses in our state. ECDI works with entrepreneurs, small business owners in all 88 of Ohio's counties. It's based in Columbus, has offices in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Akron, Canton, Toledo, and Portsmouth. It was recently listed by federal, the federal government as the largest U.S. micro lender by volume of business. Kenny told 10TV's Tracy Townsend when she started the company in 2004, it was to give access to people who would otherwise be shut out of entrepreneurial opportunities. My motivation is coming from another country and seeing how many great resources the United States has. However, being able to reach out to minorities, to women, to low-income individuals is not something that most entities or nonprofits do. That's not part of their, you know, their, most nonprofits are social service, whereas we're economic development engine. Women are one of the um, highest demographics nationally to start businesses, but when you look at the success rate of women-owned businesses, they fail more often than men. Then mm -hmm. you have to ask why. And the reason is because women are very entrepreneurial. However, they don't have the network around them. They don't have access to capital like men do. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was for ECDI it was very important to address that need. ECDI has distributed more than $135 million in loans and created 13,200 jobs. Last year, 44 million of those dollars were through PPP loans. Nearly all businesses receiving PPP funds were either African-American owned, women owned, had low to moderate income, or were immigrants or refugees. Well, thank you for sharing your Sunday morning with us today. We'll see you right back here next week for Face the State.